so our next guest is uh, intervening via video conference from New York, from Columbia University. We have uh, Stephen Bellowin. Stephen Bellowin is a very widely known uh, uh, IT security uh, expert and professor, and he's been author with many uh, distinguished experts through the years of many, uh, uh, you know, many um, authoritative and deep uh, uh, analysis. Um, about uh, uh, computer security, and in particular, the security of lawful access systems. Uh, as a t we use this as a term that includes uh, back doors, front doors, uh, lawful intercept, and all those systems that are used uh, to, uh, no, for a state to access communications under some kind of authority. Uh, in particular, they wrote uh, in 2013, and then now more recently uh, a more updated version, a, 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 a paper called Lawful Hacking, which is, you know, Richard Stallman would probably object rightfully that possibly it could be called Lawful Cracking because hacking is also in, in activities which are not aimed at just, you know, going through. Okay. And, uh, and so uh, it, they really analyzed how and if uh, these kind of systems can be, can be made accountable. So I think uh, they made a, a really huge contribution and uh, I pass on the word to Stephen and I thank him to joining us. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you uh, for inviting me. I regret that logistics made it impossible for me to be there in person. Go to the next slide, please. I'm going to have to go rather quickly because uh, I've got too many slides. So when U.S. wiretap law was codified, wiretapping was very easy. Most phone uh, lines were just simple twisted pair. All you had to do to uh, tap them was attach a pair of alligator clips to the proper uh, pair of wires and just listen in. Let's go ahead a couple of slides, please. Yeah. Modern version is a little bit more sophisticated. You had a uh, so-called loop extender so you could listen from your own office, but still fundamentally twisted pair. But things, technology changed. And around 1980 in the US, you started getting alternate phone companies where you could dial a number key in an account number, and then dial the new number. So you could do signaling after the call was set up. The number that was originally dialed wasn't going to be the number to which you were actually connected. And that was starting to cause problems for uh, law enforcement. They saw this coming. Slide, please. By 1992, the FBI realized that technology was changing in ways that were not going to be friendly to wiretaps. They were anticipating ISDN and cell phones were already, mobile phones were already present. So they knew that there was going to have to be something different in the way they tapped phones. So they got Congress to pass a law that's known as CALEA, the Communications Assistance to Law Enforcement Act. Please, slide. And Basically, and this is a solution that's been adopted by uh, most industrialized countries around the world under the name Lawful Intercept, all phone switches were required to have a standardized wiretap interface. It didn't matter what your technology was, whether it was ISDN, mobile, traditional twisted pair, just provide the same standardized interface in the phone switch to which law enforcement could connect. And this way they'd be able to tap calls despite changes in technology. Slide, please. There's a problem, though. A phone switch is a computer and is therefore for hackable. Lawful intercept capability is a deliberate backdoor. How do you secure this backdoor? When this bill was first being proposed, a number of people, including me and some of my colleagues like Matt Blaze and Susan Landau, warned that this was going to be a dangerous thing to do, that it was not going to be securable. And uh, regrettably, we were correct. The, there have been a number of incidents, the best known in the so-called Athens Affair. There's a wonderful write-up in uh, IEEE publication about, uh, about it. Somebody, who it is, just is not known, hacked a phone switch in... Uh, uh, mobile phones which operated by Vodafone Greece took advantage of the lawful intercept capability built into the switch and listened in on a hundred different phone numbers up to and including the prime ministers. And these phone calls were relayed to other mobile phones 
prepaid phones bought over the counter for cash, and hence untraceable, located elsewhere within Athens. Within about two kilometer radius, but that's a, uh, a fairly large radius included, among other things, many embassies, including the US and I believe Russian embassies. So no one knows who did it, but it was a hack that could not have been done had the, uh, if it weren't for the fact that the lawful intercept mechanism was already built into the switch. Slide, please. And the problem isn't just Greece. The uh, National Security Agency, which apart from its spying on everybody mission, also has the mission of uh, securing domestic U.S. communications, tested a large variety of phone switches that had a uh, CALIA interface. Every single one they tested had security problems. This switch was, this interface just wasn't secure. There was a larger, though less publicized, incident in Italy where thousands of phone numbers were tapped. There were, there have been unconfirmed reports of the Russian mob uh, hacking into Kali interfaces in the U.S. to spy on law enforcement. Slide, please. And then technology changed again in a way that the FBI had not anticipated in 1992 when they first started pushing for this law. The uh, voice IP doesn't work architecturally the same way as a traditional phone switch did. Skype was different still. And there are lots of other forms of communication on the internet, including voice communications over multiplayer games. Should these be covered by Kalia? How? Let's take a look at the next slide, please. The essential difference with uh, VoIP is that the signaling path, how you make the request for what number you want to call, isn't going to be the same as the voice path. And the, the VoIP switch that you're contacting doesn't have to be in your jurisdiction or the FBI's jurisdiction. So I could be sitting here in my office in New York I could make a call by a VoIP provider in Switzerland, contacting someone else who's located, say, in Argentina, whose VoIP provider is in China. How is the FBI going to serve a wiretap warrant on phone companies in Switzerland, or China, what have you? And even if they could, the Signaling path will go from me over the internet to my provider in Switzerland, who will contact a provider in China, who will be talking to a call recipient in Argentina. But the voice path is actually going directly from me over the internet to Argentina. The VoIP providers aren't part of the voice path. So where do you put the tap? Even if you could put the tap in Switzerland or Beijing, the, the voice conversation itself is not going there. You don't need the kind of physical proximity that Kalia assumed. Slide, please. Skype, is, in its original incarnation, was stranger still. The, the Federal Communications Commission, the US uh, telecommunications regulator, has a document that calls its architecture bizarre. Uh, it was a peer-to-peer -peer network. There were no trusted phone switches. Calls were being relayed through other random Skype users and strongly encrypted end-to-end, -end, not because anyone was trying to thwart law enforcement, but simply because if I'm going to make a call that's going through some other random person's computer, I want some reasonable assurance that they're not going to be listening in. There was no place to put the tap. So what do you do with something like how do you implement Kalia in a Skype-like service? Slide, please. So for the last several years, the FBI has publicly advocated changes to Kalia to cover internet services. But what they want is all services, not just telephony, to have some kind of wiretap interface. They haven't introduced any bill yet in Congress, but they uh, or ask Congress to pass anything specific. They just say they want something. They keep telling Congress that they're going dark. Slide. There are several problems with this. It can't work. If you 
try to make it work, you're going to drive up costs because a lot of startups don't aren't engineered for something like this. It's going to hinder innovation. You're not going to get very innovative architectures like Skype. Skype is now one of the biggest international uh, telephone carriers in the world. It's a company that's only a few years old. And you're going to hand over the service market to countries that don't have such a requirement because, again, there's this jurisdiction issue. Because Internet services are inherently international, you know, when I connect to something, I have no idea where the servers are that I'm talking to. It's hard to tell. Phone services are inherently local. A twisted pair phone line can't go more than, oh, about 5,000 meters from the phone switch. Internet, well, I'm talking, you know, I don't know where the phone sur where the uh, server is that this Google Hangout connection is going over, which makes for much more of an international dimension. How do you handle this? There are security problems, as I've out, uh, earlier outlined. Other than that, it's a fine idea, but uh, it's not going to work. Let's skip two slides here. Uh, three, actually, let's skip, skip that one, too. So what do we do? I will first assert that maybe there isn't even a problem. There's so much more metadata being created that uh, Maybe the FBI doesn't really have a problem. Maybe they are actually able to get more information on their suspects because of the metadata created by mobile phones, by internet connections, and so on. So maybe they're actually better off. But let's assume that there is a problem. What should they do? So our proposal, which sounds wrong, is hack the endpoints. If you need to put, do some wiretaps, you plant it on the endpoint before encryption or after decryption. Maybe you put a tap in the microphone driver, the audio device driver, the video driver, what have you. Or if there is encryption going on, you don't want to do that. Just send out a very few packets with the session key encrypted with the FBI or whomever's uh, public key. Slide, please. Is this legal? Well, in the U.S., it certainly would be. Uh, the FBI has been doing hacking for a fair number of years. There are court papers from 2007 where they described it. They don't want to talk about it very much, but they filed papers in a 2007 court case where they did describe what they were trying to do. There are memos that have been released under the Freedom of Information Act that describe this. Uh, there have been press reports about this going back to about 2001. So it's certainly been going on for a long time. We actually suggest a new statute to specify the conditions under which it can be done wiretap law in the U.S. is actually very restrictive uh, because of how intrusive a wiretap is. This is even more intrusive. So we suggest an explicit statute for lawful hacking detailing the conditions under which it can be done. Slide. And it's very feasible. Today's computer systems are very buggy. They're much better than they were years ago, but they're still insecure. You look at all of the effort that Microsoft, for example, has put in over the last dozen or so years, and they put in a tremendous amount of effort. Uh, I have a great deal of admiration for what they've done. There are still critical updates uh, released virtually every month. There's a thriving market in so-called zero-day exploits, holes for which there are no fixes because vendors don't know about them. Studies show that it takes over 200 days, 200, 250 days for there to be a reasonable amount of patching going on by end users. And there is the market for these zero days. Most of the customers are intelligence agencies. That's a separate issue. This is not going to alter the volume very much because law enforcement, at least in the U.S., is not doing all that many wiretaps. In fact, the FBI already has a lab called the Domestic Communications Assistance Center that develops such technology. So the infrastructure is there. The basic legal structure is there that we think it should be improved. So we think this is feasible. Slide, please. As I said, there's a very big market for vulnerabilities. There are a lot of companies. Some of them are very legitimate. Some seem to be less so. Some will sell to all buyers. Some will sell to uh, only governments. And some will sell only to governments that appear to be responsible and democratic. That's a whole separate issue of whether or not this market should be regulated and controversial, and I'm not going to go into that 
question today. Slide, please. Well, here's just some numbers from about three and a half years ago on the number of vulnerabilities found per month. Yes, there's been some change, but not very much. We're still seeing lots of new vulnerabilities. Our code is still buggy. Buggy software is the oldest unsolved problem in computer science. I expect it to remain that way for many years to come. Slide. So, is this going to hurt security? No. The bugs are already there. Finding them doesn't cause the problem. The developers cause the problem. We're just exploiting the problem. We're also advocating a mandatory reporting uh, requirement that would be in the legislation we propose. If law enforcement finds or buys a vulnerability, it must report it immediately to the vendor. That will lead to a patch, patch so it's going to help overall security. Again, it's not going to interfere with the wiretaps. Most of the actual tapping software is, vo is vulnerability independent, so you're not going to have to change that particularly often. Slide. So how do you do it? You first need to scan the target or target network to figure out which device, what kind of computer it is, and pick the vulnerability. You've got to worry about NATs. You've got to worry about multiple devices in a residence figure out the operating system and software used, the version of software, and so on. Then you select a vulnerability and build a tapping package. You install it, whether it's a drive-by download, an infected attachment, hack the target from the outside. Sometimes, in extreme cases, the FBI has been known to conduct what they call black bag jobs, physically breaking into a suspect's uh, residence or office and physically hacking the computer that way. So they do all of these things as necessary. This is not new for them. Slide. We are worried about proliferation. Once these exploits are out there in the wild, uh, somebody might reuse them. So the answer is to obfuscate the code. Again, standard technique. You want to strongly tie the tapping package to the target machine. Use serial numbers, disk MAC addresses, things like that, lying registry keys, things that are already lying around the computer, and use that to encrypt part of the uh, tapping package. Most computers today, at least from commercial vendors, not as opposed to open source, uh, include digital rights management software. Great. Let's go use that. As long as that nasty stuff is going to be there anyway, let's use it for a good purpose and use that to restrict the uh, tapping software to work only on that one machine. In many situations, in fact, you can erase the exploit code that you used as soon as you installed your actual tapping package. That is to say, hack into the machine, download the tap package, then delete the uh, hacking part. You don't need that anymore. So it's never going to be, in fact, you can do it each time, so it's never even stored on disk. Standard techniques used by virus and malware writers already. So again, we're not teaching the bad guys anything new. Slide, please. So the full picture. Law enforcement and perhaps private sector labs find these holes that develop the exploit tools and the tapping tools. New holes are reported to the vendor. When the need arises, get a scanning warrant from the court. Uh, most legal authorities think you need a scanning warrant. First, figure out the target's operating system, applications, and so on. Get a second warrant for hacking, then plant the wiretap code. Slide. This sounds wrong, but it helps. It doesn't introduce new security holes the way a lawful access requirement could. It works without regard to national boundaries. If there are jurisdictional requirements, the courts and the source country are going to have to take care of that. The mandatory reporting element will improve security. The new law will regularize and regulate the hacking that already takes place and will lead to actual public debate on the subject. Most ordinary citizens don't know that this is going on, might or might not approve. Let's have an open debate on the subject. And this is a very important thing in a democracy. Law enforcement should only be doing what the people say should be permissible. So we think that this is strictly better than a mandatory requirement for backdoors. Slide. 
So a few extra references. Uh, myself, Matt Blaze, Sandy Clark, one of his PhD students, and Susan Landau wrote two papers on the subject. Going Bright and IEEE Security and Privacy is a more technical paper. Uh, later, actually, it's out to appear as wrong, is a, uh, a law review uh, describing some of the legal and policy issues in great depth. The uh, white paper by uh, CDT on the risks of uh, wiretaps, New York Times editorial, and for those worried about the new crypto back do uh, crypto key escrow whatever requirements that have been talked about a lot, especially but not only in the U.S. India's had a proposal on the table and so on in recent years. This is a report that I and a cast of many others uh, released just recently. So, thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, I, I think we have uh, a question from Richard Stallman for you. Please. Do we have a microphone? There's some echo here. Uh, I more or less agree with what you've said, but I ha have one point about terminology and one question. About terminology, I'd like to suggest <clears throat> regarding terminology, I'd just like to suggest not using the term, quote, digital rights management, unquote, because that term was chosen by the proponents of it to whitewash it. So I call it digital restrictions management. But turning to a question that's related in substance, I read that in the past, uh, the state couldn't go and poke at people's phone lines directly, that it would send a wiretap order to a phone company. People in the phone company would, take tra would make transcriptions of the calls that were relevant and hand those over. My understanding is that with uh, digital technology, the state got much more access to listen to people's phone calls than it had before, and this seems like a dangerous thing. Is, it, is what I read correct? And if so, what do you think about this change? Uh, I, do, I do not think that is in fact correct. Uh, one of the slides I didn't show, you can, you can go uh, look at these slides later, uh, sli but slide number three shows a picture of what's called a loop extender, which would probably be installed by telephone company personnel, but it's a device that ties two uh, twisted pairs together, one going to the uh, target's uh, phone, the other to an otherwise unused uh, twisted pair going to a law enforcement office. It's called a loop extender, and it uh, relayed the calls on one pair to the other so they could do the taps from the uh, uh, comfort of their own offices instead of sitting out there and a uh, climbing up a telephone pole. There's uh, phone company personnel did have to be involved in the tap. Kalia made that less likely. The fact that this new scheme does not require uh, outside companies' participation is a weakness of the scheme, but law enforcement has been moving away from that in any event uh, because they don't want to have to trust more people. Also, phone company oversight has been comparatively uh, minimal, to put it very mildly. So it's not been a, a really effective restriction. Well, it's not exactly that, that the phone company is expected to defend our rights. It's just that this way, if they get an order to tap so-and-so's phone, they'll only tap so-and-so's phone. They have to tell the phone company, put the loop extender on so-and-so's phone, and so even if the phone company isn't bothering to check very much, it still makes it harder for them to just listen to a thousand people because they feel like it. A absolutely, but Kalia was or had already moved away from that. They could make digital requests from their own consoles. We Steve agree that that's, that we agree that that's a, a weakness of this proposal. We feel that's a lesser weakness than putting uh, new holes into phone switches and internet communication services. Uh, yes, Stephen, I would like to um, you know, say that uh, I think personally, you know, your work at a proposal is uh, fantastic and, and uh, great work to build upon. 
uh, this it, three points I'd like to um, suggest as possible um, issues and uh, extension or, or improvements. Number one is that these uh, certifications and safeguards for the systems that you describe system would be hard. Uh, it would it would be hard to trust the U.S. government to set these standards. Now the way NIST standards would work are corrupted, so there would be very unlikely that we could trust current uh, governance to actually come out with standards that we can trust. They, they would appear to be trustworthy, and that's even worse than trustworthiness. The second issue is that uh, uh, you describe the problems that come with the uh, the, 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 the pieces of, ma of, of, ma of malware that are used to penetrate and then to actually do the work inside the machine. You know, uh, But there's a connected problem is the management infrastructure. There's often computers that manage these systems, not to, uh, throughput. There's also distributed infrastructure of you know, uh, proxy systems and so on, which are used to do this work and which are necessary to make it accountable for the logging and so on. This system I usually run on generic uh, or overly complex systems, which are, I know, uh, with tens of millions of lines of code and so on. So even if we get the, the, the malware you know, uh, things, you know, perfectly done, we still have the weakest link in the management infrastructure. We've seen hacking team scandal in which we've seen older code going out there and so on, and, um, and, and everyone could see you know, that these systems are not, not, are not up to very, very high standards. They're used basically, you have, they have corporate level enterprise you know, standards, which probably shouldn't be the case. Um, the third issue is that uh, um, you, you said that uh, your proposal would require the, U the U.S. government to report new vulnerabilities that they find, and of course uh, uh, pr prohibit them to create new pro uh, vulnerabilities. So use the existing ones. Um, I, I feel that that would be kind of unlikely politically, because if they did so, uh, you know, uh, for real, then they would be the only one in the world to do it. No, all, all the other uh, countries would do it. You no. Know, States, uh, you know, China and so on, they would create new vulnerabilities, they would find new ones and not tell everybody. And so it would be kind of like IBM, IBM takes all the free software and use it to put uh, a proprietary layer on top. So the superiority, you would lose a lot on that. So my, my suggestion is, is that basically your scenario is perfect for up to a certain level of security, of assurance. But for highest levels of assurance, then you may want to have additional requirements and, um, and actually think about uh, possibly other solutions for, lo for lawful access. You know, I don't know. That's, that's a lot of questions. I'm sorry. Well, we thought very hard before we came and talked about this for a couple of years before we came up with this solution. We were actually very surprised by it ourselves. It's not that we thought this was a really great idea. It's that it was that we it was the best that we could come up with that didn't introduce new holes. As for the standards issue, the CALEA standards actually are not U.S. government standards. They were developed by a private sector organization. The law actually specified that uh, the private sector could come up with its own standards and the government would only step in with its standards if the private sector did not. The IETF refused to cooperate. Other groups did step up and, uh, and produce them. It's the so-called J standard. And that standard alone is so complex it scares me. The software would be even more complex, and that alone scares me. So we felt that trying to come up with standard interfaces for hacking was a bad idea. Will other countries uh, mandate backdoors? Probably some will. Uh, it's a bad idea for any, for any country. Will some countries do hacking on their own? Sure, but that's already going on. One of the reasons for the mandatory re uh, reporting requirement is to try to make our systems more secure, which will reduce crime, uh, including the hacking that the U.S. describes to China and Russia that they describe as an extremely serious problem. So balancing everything, we think this is the best answer. And again, it's already going on by many countries around the world. Uh, so let's try to regulate it, regularize it, discuss it publicly. Um, yes, so thanks, Stephen. I, I really think it's the best proposal around and uh, has uh, really a lot of potential as a direction. So 
Uh, I thank you a lot for taking the time. And uh, uh, now we move on to, um, uh, to uh, a, a video presentation, which actually I, I would start. Uh, well, first of all, I thank you for Stephen. Thank you.